Peggy Jackson is really the, the steam behind this thing. She gets it going, she plans it, and there's folks who always come alongside to help out who are not members of our church. This is bigger than our church. This is an, a, a community event. Uh, we depend on people who are not members of our church to put this on every year, and it's great. Um, when I was at the uh, 50th anniversary of Dr. King's death in Memphis, uh, a, a famous white pastor from Dallas who's planted a bunch of churches, he spoke, and one of the things he said is, uh, white people don't know what they don't know. And what he meant by that is you can probably survey a, a number of folks, and they're good people, but uh, on one hand, they'll tell you about black history. They'll usually say Dr. King. Uh, they'll either say Malcolm X or Malcolm 10, depending on how old they are. Uh, and, th and now they're going to struggle. They're going to may maybe, you know, one or two others, but that's it. And if we've done one poor thing in this country, it's educating people about a race of folks that have been significant in moving our country's history forward. So one of the reasons why we do this, yes, yes. I didn't learn any of this stuff in school. One of the reasons we do this every year is to educate. And our prayer is that as you get educated and learn, your mind opens up and you start understanding folks who are not like you. So that's why we do this every year. It is great that you're here. We got a good cast and uh, we're gonna pray and then the show's gonna start, I believe. Right, Pastor? Awesome, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for getting us together. Uh, we thank you for this person called Mahalia Jackson who sang heavenly tunes, who brought heaven down to earth when she sang, uh, who, who was a witness for you uh, in not just gospel, but other aspects of music as well. We're gonna learn about her tonight, uh, learn about her strengths, her weaknesses, her struggles, and we just thank you for getting this group together tonight that we can learn more about this individual who blessed this nation uh, during her lifetime. Be with us here tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We all say amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to be your MC and your narrator, Willie Sladen. And uh, before we start to get into the show, I just want to go over and embrace some things my pastor said. We always hear about the story of the classics. So you will hear about MLK a lot, uh, Malcolm X. But as we hear those stories, I just want to challenge you to be in tune to the things you hear. You know, great people surround themselves with even greater people. Great people went on to do great things. So as you hear those stories, you're going to hear people's names that pop up. So challenge yourself. Follow some of the people who went in MLK's entourage, who traveled along with Dr. King, who traveled along with Malcolm X. You know, they always had guys and women and other significant people around them that supported the fight, who always kept their head and their minds clean and just kept pushing them to forge on and do better and create change. So we don't have to settle for those simple and those regular and ordinary stories of the people we know. We can always be better and be great and go on and try to sing for the unsung hero. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Now, before we get into the play, I'd like to bring up some young ladies to the stage as they perform a spoken word performance. So Ms. Brown and Ms. Regina, could you please come to the stage for me?
Mahalia Jackson was an American gospel singer who became one of the most influential gospel singers in the world and was heralded internationally as a singer and civil rights activist. She was referred to by many as the queen of gospel. Mahalia Jackson was born on October 26, 1911 in New Orleans, Louisiana. Her parents were John Jackson Sr. and Charity Clark. She was raised in the Black Pearl neighborhood which is located in Uptown region. Mahalia Jackson was named after her auntie, Mahalia Clark Paul, who was known by most as Aunt Duke. Mahalia grew up in a three-room house which gave shelter to 13 people and a dog. She lived in that house with her mom, Charity Clark, her brother, Peter, along with several aunties and cousins. Her mother worked as a maid in a laundress. Mahalia started singing at the age of four at the well-known Mount Moriah Baptist Church. She was about at the age of five when her mother Charity died at the young age of 25. This left the family to decide who would raise Mahalia and Peter. Aunt Duke assumed responsibility to raise them. Everyone knew that Aunt Duke had a reputation for being a tough disciplinarian. She forced Mahalia and brother Peter to work from sunup to sundown. School was hardly an option. Aunt Duke would always inspect the house with the white glove method. If the house was not cleaned properly, Mahalia would be whipped. Boy, it's still bought doll. I used to make rag doll with red grass to tear for its head. I never saw a Christmas tree except in my church. And I learned to make all kinds of things with my hands. To get firewood for our kitchen stove, I take a wheelbarrow and an axe and go down along the river levee, picking up old wood from splitting gardens that were sinking into the mud. After that, I will lay them on the ground and watch the steamboats go by. When you passed the age of seven, you became a mother to the younger children. My youngest aunt, Bessie, was only 12 when my mother died. She took me with her to the white folks' house to work odd jobs to keep me out of trouble. We will wake up every morning and get the children dressed for school, feed them breakfast, and clean the kitchen. In the afternoon, we would return to help out again. We made $2 a week. Between our houses were railroad tracks, which hauled freights from docks up. One of the white chairman would allow us to go on his caboose to these big sugar cane factories, where we would get these big, juicy stalks to chew on. After that, we would go down along the railroad and pick up lumps of coal, from, and pick up lumps of coal. And by the time winter came, we'd have tons of more coal in the bin. The riders, the white family whom my Aunt Bell worked for, treated us well. They would give us clothes, and we were grateful because they were usually the best clothes we had growing up. In those days, it was custom in New Orleans to share food with the color servants. What wasn't completed at dinner was given to the Negro widows to take home to their families. This was helpful because it meant many mouths were fed and fewer children would go hungry. The Negroes' wives were known for being good cooks. They were influenced by French crew of cooking. You could always go to down to the river to catch buckets of fish, crab, and shrimp. In our gardens, we grew okra, green beans, red beans, tomatoes, peas, and other types of vegetables. And from the swamps, you could get baby alligators and turtles. In the forest, you could get possum and raccoon. And from the trees, you could get peaches, figs, apples, bananas, and other types of fruit. My Duke stood for so little play at home that I spent most of my spare time at the Baptist Church. There was service there every evening. 
I love best to sing in the congregation of our church, Mount Moriah Baptist Church. All around me, I could hear foot tapping and hand clapping. And as David said in the Bible, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And that's what I did. I made a joyful noise. house in the mall. She always saw to it that I became secretary so that she know everybody's business. If she'd been educated enough, she might have even run for mayor of the town. I swore to myself that I was going to get away. Some way, I was going to get away. By the age of 16, Mahalia was getting a lot of encouragement from some family members to move. Mahalia's cousin Freddie was her music buddy, and he was always urging her and asking her to seek her musical destiny. Her Aunt Hannah was always trying to convince her to move with her to Chicago. Although Aunt Duke and her father were not fans of Chicago, they had a lot of anxiety about Chicago gangsters. After seeing how other family members were doing in Chicago, Mahalia felt she too could make it there. Mahalia finally took her auntie up on her offer and decided to move. She and her aunt Anna boarded the Illinois Central train, loaded all their suitcases, accompanied with a large basket of food. On May 18, 1896, the Supreme Court ruled in a case of Plessy versus Ferguson that separate but equal facilities was considered sufficient to satisfy the 14th Amendment. Unfortunately, in those days, blacks had to be prepared for the impact of Jim Crow law. They could purchase first-class tickets, but would often end up in the baggage cars. If the segregated coach seats were filled, baggage cars were unheated. The dining room were off limits to blacks, although all the uniformed waiters employed by the railroad were black. The promise of good fortune waiting in Chicago made the unbearable three-day trip worth it. In Chicago, blacks were advancing. Not only were they making money, they were active in all kinds of clubs and organizations. Mahalia said it was nice to see that, that church people of color in Chicago had high dreams. They were talking about different things than we were down south, things like getting educated and going into business. People of color were doing more than just singing and praying, and Mahalia began to see a whole new world. On the south side, she saw many blacks who owned businesses. The Jewish people still owned delicatessens in the clothing shops, but there were a lot of blacks who owned barbershops, drugstores, and little eating places. It really inspired Mahalia and gave her hope that she could help and learn something from her thriving people. It made her feel that one day she too could own her own business. When the depression hit Chicago, the life, of, the life that blacks had built for themselves all fell apart. On the south side, it was as if someone had pulled the switch and everything stopped running. 
Every day, another big mill or factory would lay off all the people of color. Suddenly, the streets were full, full of men and women who were put out of work and had no jobs. Banks all over the south side locked their doors, and there would be lines of people outside crying in the streets over their lost wages, falling to their knees and praying. Blacks had to be innovative to stay alive any way they could in Chicago. Men took their cars and turned them into jitney buses. They would ride around all day, picking up passengers off street corners, charging them about 10 cents to carry them from downtown and cross town. It was not lawful, and the police tried to put a stop to it because the jitney buses were killing off the regular business that, that was implied to buses in the Charlie car companies. Places called buffet flats were established by blacks. These joints offered buffet of boozes, sex, shows, marijuana, and other, other illegal activities. They were typically located in privately owned apartments or a house that had been divided into apartments. The police officer turned a blind eye to these establishments. There were terrible times, but the Lord kept his arms around Mahalia. Although Mahalia was a lifelong Baptist, Jackson got a great deal of inspiration from the music and holiness of the church. She felt that it was a powerful beat, a rhythm of slave days, that the music was strong and expressive, and she would bring herself to tears just by listening. She was too poor to have music training, so she would listen to Bessie Smith in May, May Rain, which is where she learned her moans, her groans, shouts, and her clapping style. Mahalia became a member of the Johnson Singers, a group that would sing in neighborhood churches for just as much as $1.50 a night. The money would come from the passing around of the offering plate. It was the only way churches could make money for heating coal and monthly mortgage. Many of the Johnson singers found it very hard to remain singing and working all at the same time, so Mahalia would find herself singing solo. Mahalia managed to save a few dollars for herself after turning over a small contribution to her auntie for rent. People who heard her was always complimenting her on her voice and would tell her she would be taking lessons. One night in 1932, when she and a friend each had saved about $4 singing at the church, they took that money and they went to see Professor Dubois about singing lessons. Dubois understood music was a way of shining a light on the idea of dual consciousness. The belief that black people have to learn to operate in two Americas, one that is black and one that is white, while consciously being able to make movement between both identities. I'm a musician. I play piano, but I really would learn how to sing better. And my name is Mahalia, and I've never had any lessons of any kind. I just uh, like to sing. All right, we'll listen to the right place at the right time. I want to, to uh, come, can you come over here? I want to see if y'all know this song called Standing in Need of Prayer. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. All right, 
Well, you know, you try. Mm. All right. this song for me, baby. you saying like that. Mm. Sounding like you saying it's been in the jungle. And you know what? Because, listen, even, we want you to be able to sing so that you're a credit to our race, but the way you sing is a disgrace to our race. <laughs> you mm. know, so, but I can tell you this, you keep working, we're going to get you together. Mm. All right? Gabrielle, I'll tell you this, that Honey, you got so dark. Yeah. You know what? So I know we're gonna we're gonna get you so that you gonna be you said already got the potential now. So the more you if you come back next time and we're gonna have you singing so that the sparrows gonna come out the trees and hum with you. Wow. So, but that's it for today. Y'all have a blessed day. <sighs> That was so much fun. We should mm. come again. Mm -mm. That was amazing. It's not for me, and he can keep himself and his high class music. Well, well mm -hmm. I can teach you how to sing the song. The lesson from Professor Dubois turned out to be her one and only lesson. She continued to sing with the Johnson Group. As time went on, Mahalia was singing at African-American churches in multiple cities. Even though Mahalia traveled widely, she barely earned enough money to pay for her expenses. Between trips, she always tried to work and earn money. She worked many different jobs, being the laundress in at the hotel as a maid when she wasn't even traveling. Mahalia met professors Thomas Andrew Dorsey. Dorsey was known as the father of gospel music and was at one time so closely associated with the field that songs written in a new style was sometimes called Dorsey's. Thomas Dorsey was the music director at Pilgrim Baptist Church in Chicago. From the beginning of, his profession, of their professional relationship, Dorsey sees that her talent and her natural audience appeal. Dorsey said, she had talent, she just had it natural, but being naturally talented is not enough. One must know how to use it, how to exude it. He wanted Mahalia to thrill her audience. Mahalia had the natural tendency to start off shouting and sing her songs faster than Dorsey wanted. She was known as a stretch out singer, meaning that she chased the melody in the meter of the music as the spirit moved her. Her style was borrowed from the Baptist lining style, which allowed the singer to reshape a melody of any song in form of personal testimony. Dorsey recognized this in the traits in, in Mahalia and sought to make her anew and find a way to help her temper her performance, gradually building into her trademark shouts, claps, and moans. M Mahalia began to travel with Mr. Dorsey, together singing in churches and conventions. Dorsey's best known composition, Take My Hand, Precious Lord, was performed by Mahalia. The two had traveled all over the country playing and celebrating the Gospels. Precious Lord, walk all over God's heaven. I'm going to live the life I sing about 
and Peace in the Valley. He would have copies of these songs on hand and would sell them for 10 cents a copy. Gospel singing to hold in Chicago, but many black ministers objected to the style. They didn't like the hand clapping and stomping. They felt singers were bringing jazz into the church and it wasn't dignified. Mahalia felt that the European hymns were beautiful songs, but just not Negro music. She felt most blacks liked to use their hands and their feet. She stated, how can you sing preferably of heaven and earth and all God's wonders without using your hands? She felt it was her calling that God wanted her to sing gospel. Gospel music is nothing but singing of good tithing straight from the human heart. In 1934, her grandfather came to visit her in Chicago but fell sick. Mahalia felt responsible for getting him ill because he went out on her request. She prayed to God saying that if he would make her grandfather well again, she would never step foot into another theater again. Her grandfather got well, and she kept her vow because she believed that God answered her prayers and it would just not be right to go back on her word and vow to him. In Chicago around 1935, during a social at a church, Mahalia met a young man who was a graduate from Fisk University and Tuskegee Institute. His name was Isaac Hockenhold. He specialized in chemistry, but after graduation, there were no teaching jobs for chemists much less any work in Chicago laboratories. So Ike had to become a mail carrier for the post office. He soon became the center figure in Mahalia's circle, a serious young man with a resonant voice. Ike was 10 years older than Mahalia. He believed that Mahalia had a voice that could make her great concert artist, and he felt that he could show her the way. They dated for about a year, then married. Mahalia kept singing, washing, ironing, why Ike struggled trying to make money. Let's see what's here in the paper today. Oh, that's interesting. 
Hmm. Well, hell yeah. I can't believe things aren't looking up for me. I would have thought by now things have changed. I'm afraid that my life is doomed to failure. When I graduated from college, I had high hopes that I could conquer the world. I came here to Chicago expecting to get a, a really good job, mm -hmm. but then the depression came and wiped out most of the good jobs. I started that cosmetics business, and I couldn't make it go. I guess I'm just lucky to have my job as a mail carrier. I don't be discouraged. You're an intelligent, ambitious, well-meaning young man who deserves a better opportunity. Have faith that God will make a way. You know, I have nothing to count on in the future but you, Mahalia. You have a voice. I know you like singing gospel, but I wish I could persuade you to stop singing that gospel and start singing for money. You passed up a wonderful offer to sing with the Louis Armstrong Band. Your travel gets in the way of us. We we'll never spend any time together. You could get some voice training. <laughs> Why do you want to waste your time on that stuff? It's not art. I don't care if it's art. And oh no, don't ask me to take voice lessons again. One time, when a teacher tried to teach me how to sing a song, I felt as if he were trying to strangle me. He called my singing hollering and a disgrace to the Negro race. See, Ike, you don't understand, because your life isn't in the church. But it comes from my heart. It has something for me. I love it and sing it just the way I did down south when those folks were singing on the great Bible Baptist churches on the Mississippi River when I was a child. Mm. Well, yeah, you could be a blues singer. You'd be a wonderful blues singer. What Negro couldn't be a blues singer, Ike? I'll never give up my gospel songs for blues. Blues songs are the songs of despair, but gospel songs are the songs of hope. You have a feeling that there's a cure for what's wrong. I get to singing and I feel better right away. A person who only sings the blues is like somebody hollering from a pit for help. And I simply don't find myself in that situation. You know, we don't have a penny between us, Mahalia. You need to take a look at this article. You might find this pretty interesting. What's in here? The Mikado Company, a federal theater project for Negro. Yeah. There you they go. are holding auditions yeah. this week you... in Chicago yeah. Yeah. to select a girl with outstanding vocals for leading roles. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You, hmm. could, you could win that part, Mahalia. All you have to do is go down there and sing for them. I know you could win that part. Mm-mm. It's not for me. I'm not getting mixed up with those type of songs. I want to stick with my gospel songs. You're missing out on opportunities and throwing your life away, right? That theater could give you the training and experience that you never get any other way. You're never going to get anywhere running in and out of these churches, hollering your head off with those gospel songs. Don't you understand? God gave you a voice, and you're not using it to become a great artist. Not using it? I'm using it for God's work. That's how I'm using it. When I sing, I don't feel like becoming a great artist. I sing the way I feel. Mm. There's no money in this house, Mahalia. That theater would pay you $600 a week, and we are broke. <laughs> I tell you what. I'm going to go out and look for work, right? And you ought to do the same. He just doesn't understand that everything inside of me is fighting against the type of singing I would do on stage. What am I to do? Lord knows we could use the money. I'll go so I can tell him I tried. I won't get it anyway.
Hello. Hello, are you here for the audition? Yes, ma'am. That way, please. Where's your music? You have to bring copies of the song you want to sing. Well, I was going to sing some out of this. That won't work. No one want to hear anything out of that. Mm. There's a store nearby. You should go there. All right. I'll be back. I see you found the store. Amen. And you were able to find some music. You're next. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, is anybody out there? Tell us your name and what are you going to sing today? My name is Mahalia, Mahalia Jackson, and I'm going to sing a Negro spiritual. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Start whenever you're ready. Like a motherless child, motherless child, motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Alone. Why didn't you sing the song when it was played the first time? Because I never heard it played that way before. Mm. <laughs> well, they seem to like it. <sighs> <sighs> never mind, you may go. Well, they seem to like it, but I made God a promise a long time ago when he made my grandfather well that I would never set foot in a picture theater or a vaudeville house ever again. And I believe God granted my prayer because my grandfather lived for several years after. And I really don't think picture theater for me anyway. Oh, Mahalia? No, she's not here. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. I can take a message for her. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. I'll definitely give her that message. Thank you. Thank you. And you have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mahalia, the theater called. You got the part. You won that audition. You won it. Yes. <laughs> Woo! <sighs> you got to be happy. Yeah. I guess I got it. Amen. Well, um, what's your luck been? Oh, it's been all right. <laughs> I got that job. You, you got the job? Yeah. But, but wait, you got right, the but, job. Right. 
Well, then that settles wait, it. Wait, I'm not going wait, back wait, to that brother. Wait, we need to I, the no, the Lord can do it. No, we no. prayed. He answered no, our prayer. No, 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 no. I am we not going back no, no more. We, he answered it. Won't he do it? No, yes, don't he leave. Wait, 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 Things were never really the same between Ike and Mahalia. He knew he could never change her. They stayed together for a while, but they had other problems. Gradually, they began to lead separate lives. However, they remained close friends. People sometimes ask her, how does it feel being divorced when her life is so close to the church? She answered, it's because she's meant to give her life to the church, that it had to be that way, and she's not ashamed. By the end of the Depression, in the 30s, Mahalia was earning enough, to, uh, earning enough from singing that she had no longer no need to continue working as a maid or a laundress. Eventually, Mahalia decided that she needed something other than just singing to fall back on. In 1939, she attended a beauty school and started a beauty shop called Mahalia's Beauty Salon. A short time later, she opened a flower shop called Mahalia's House of Flowers. Both became very popular on the south side of Chicago. With Mahalia being so popular, she was able to employ many talented pianists and organists. But no, no one, none of the talented as Mildred Falls. Mildred was more of a genius in her own right. She could use the keyboard to its fullest as a percussive as well as a melodic instrument. Mildred never got lost in the call and response gospel style that Mahalia had made her signature style. She gave Mahalia the latitude she needed, the freedom to add lib new lyrics, break times, and alter the melodic line and the heat and the passion while building the meaning of any song. Mildred adored Mahalia and cherished their alliance. Mahalia gave Mildred whatever she wanted to her for pay. Mildred was pleased to get a regular paycheck, so she never complained. But as time went on, though Mildred was a valuable asset to Mahalia, Mahalia did not see any need to increase Mildred's pay, even though her salary itself had increased. Mahalia was at the point in her life where she was making $3,000 a night to as much as $7,000. She would pay Mildred $200 a week. Mildred realized Mahalia was making more money, so Mildred asked her for a raise. Mahalia was upset that Mildred would even ask for more money. So as time moved on, their relationship changed, and Mahalia Soonly, soon fired Mildred. Mildred was very, Mahalia was very careful with her money. She was always filled for returning to being poor, which led her to trust no one. She remembered that her Uncle Porter told her something. Don't trust anyone in this world but yourself. And whenever you work, whatever work you do, remember, get paid in cash and get paid in full. In 1947, her single, Move On Up a Little Higher, took her to a higher level of her singing career. The song became the highest selling single song in gospel history. Move On Up a Little Higher, a song about the afterlife, also as a song about equality. Hidden in the message to Jackson listeners was the preaching that you could overcome any obstacle or heavy burden, poverty, segregation, racism, as well as sexism. Her songs had the feeling of a Baptist sermon, the way she would sing in her signature style.
Mahalia's career was taking off, and she became more in demand, making radio and television appearances and going on tour, eventually performing in Carnegie Hall on October 4th, 1950, to a racially integrated audience. Mahalia also had success in 1952 on a tour abroad in Europe, and she was especially popular in France and Norway. She felt that they did not understand her music. In a way, she was correct. They loved her style, but did not necessarily understand her words. Her song, I Can Put My Trust in Jesus, won an award from the French Academy of Music. She went on to Holland, Belgium, and Denmark. Even though they couldn't understand the words, they were filled with such religious feeling that many wept during the concerts. The morning after her concert in Copenhagen, children filled the hotel lobby with flowers. In the next few days, people ordered 50,000 copies of her record, Silent Night. Mahalia got sick during the tour. She prayed to get through her performances, but in three months' time, she had lost more than 90 pounds. They canceled the rest of the concert tour and flew her back to Chicago for a major operation. In 1954, she was invited to have her own radio program on a big CBS station in Chicago. A year later, it became a television show. The credits were wonderful to her. One wrote, after when you hear Mahalia sing, even the elevator men begin to bounce. <laughs> the audience swept with summertime and was so fractured by didn't it ring that they had to call for an intermission. Things were going so well for Mahalia, she would let letters and receive them from people saying how much they liked the program. Mahalia got so carried away about how people were responding to her that one day at a meeting at the television station, she asked, why don't we make this a network show instead of a local Chicago program? Then, more, then I could sing to more people. There was a long, embarrassing moment of silence. Then one of the television men said, we would love to, Mahalia, but we can't do it. You're all right here in Chicago with a local sponsor, but there isn't a sponsor who sells his product down south that would take a chance on a Negro singer. They're afraid of what the Southerners, they just might not like it. Until Mahalia's singing made her famous, she lived so far inside the colored people's world that she didn't have time to pay attention to every day in the way white people in the country acted. After traveling internationally, Mahalia almost forgot about discrimination in the United States. It took her to travel down south to open her eyes to see discrimination was still active and alive. It was a nightmare. There was no place for blacks to eat or sleep along major highways. Food shops, teenage girl car hops would come bouncing out of cars and then stop dead in their tracks when they saw Mahalia and the rest of the performers were blacks being refused service. Some gasoline stations didn't want to sell them oil or gas. Some would not allow them to use their restrooms. Many of the black performers slept in their cars. Many times they lived on fruits and brown bag lunches. They would scramble for food once they made it to their destination. Mahalia once made a comment about how things were with her moving back and forth between the white and colored worlds every day, and she stated, the stupidity and cruelty of some white people toward blacks hit you so hard, you don't know whether to explode or pray for someone with such hatred in their soul. The hardest thing for people of color to understand about white people is this fear and hatred they seem to have towards us. The only thing we are interested in is equal rights, mm -hmm. where we can yes. make a living to survive, you understand, and to have an education. Only the grace of God that has brought me thus far, being an unlearned woman, uh, uh, not able. And what was I going to try to learn for down there? Well, no, it was no work for me. If I'd have got a chance to go to college, there was nothing for me to do but still push the white people's buggy their babies and clean their babies and clean their house. It's just, it's just since I've been up north, a little bit, a little bit of opportunities open. That's another thing <laughs> that puzzles me. I don't know this thing. It's it's peculiar. Um, when I'm on the stage and, and on television and working with white people, they just hug me and love me and say I'm so wonderful and I'm so great. 
And then when I'm walking down the street like an ordinary citizen, they don't uh, rec uh, recognize me. And when I go into the department store in the South, they, uh, I can't get a sandwich. I can't get a bottle of pop. I got to stand. I can't even get a cab. And I'm just the Mahila Jackson that they got through saying how wonderful I am. What? I don't understand this. What yeah. make people act like that? Well, this is the big question, Mahalia, the split in people. Uh, I do want to... I, 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 I want to see my people be respected. You know, it's the most distasteful thing to hear a white man call your man, your husband or your brother a boy. Like, he's... That, he's no boy. He's a man like anybody. That's disrespect. That's the height of of, uh, of ignorance, complete ignorance, um, for people to, to treat people like that. It's awful. It just hurts me. And I'm so hate about it. It keeps me praying, you know, for the Lord not, not to let hate get in my heart. This world will make you think, I tell you. It'll make you think because if you don't, you go down the drain in despair, and I don't believe in letting nothing uh, get down in my soul. I'll speak it out so I can be free, because if it stay inside, well, my God, I'll become a hateful woman, and I don't want to hate. I want to love. God knows. Right now, the people down south that are mistreating, I feel that I could still yeah. well, this be is, friends to them and do what I could. Uh, this is, of course, the hope of uh, Reverend Martin Luther King and people like you and Ralph Abernathy. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, walk together, children, don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. And this promised land is right here in America. I was born here and ain't going here. They expect to die right here, too. If they kill me for freedom, then I'll be, be buried on the land of free, as it is said, right in America. But we're going to walk together right here, sing together, shout together. Mahalia had a mind of her own, so she would interpret the music that she sung just the way she wanted. Though the music were for all people, she targeted women and affirmed gospel messages saying that God supports them in their survival and liberation from whatever forces were holding them back. Mahalia's music reflected the issues black people were facing at, at the time. Yet, interest, at, yet even more interestingly, she, her music appeared to the white audiences. The whites considered her to be safe, a safe black figure, someone they felt not challenged by or that wouldn't challenge the status quo. She used her unique position to issue a pathetic challenge to the white audience, making them aware that the way white America affected black lives. Mahalia Jackson's radical witness seemed simple. Her singing was a testimony. She would witness to the glory of God as well as witness to the state and life of black people. She sought to end racial injustice in America through what she sang. Although Mahalia was the first black artist in broadcasting, the show could not attract enough sponsors, however mainly in the South, and it was eventually canceled eight months later. Dinah Shore was one of the top TV personalities of the time. She was an American singer, actress, and top charting female vocalist in the 1940s. She rose to prominence as a recording artist during the Big Bang era, the Big Band era. Dinah was the first white star to insist that her network, CBS, enter into a contract with Mahalia for her appearance on the Dinah Shore Show. It was to be a historic alliance, the blonde talk show hostess, TV darling, and the queen of gospel. That would make a big dent in the rigid Jim Crow hiring process of the entertainment industry. The two women, both powerful women in their own style and manner, had privately admired each other in their public appearances, despite the collective fears of their agents, producers, and respective entourages. It was a mutual attraction at first sight. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And Mahalia, I just love your voice. I don't have to tell you that. I marvel every time I hear you. There's so much rhythm and feeling that comes out of you. Well, Dinah, I feel like it was something that was given to me. 
Well, it may have been given to you, but you sure have done a lot with it. Well, that's what worries me, Dinah. I don't feel like I'm doing enough. Oh, well, we can do something about that. How about a duet? A duet? I love duets. They entertain me. Entertain you? What do you mean? <laughs> yes, well, you know I love to hear other people sing. Oh, no, Mahalia, don't do that to me. I'm depending on you to carry the load, okay? <laughs> All right, here we go. Come on, children, let's sing about the goodness of the Lord. Come on, children, let's shout all about God's rich reward. God's a footsteps every day. Leads us on the narrow way. Come on, children, let's sing about the goodness of the Lord. Come on, children, let's sing about the goodness of the Lord. Come on, children, let's shout all about God's rich reward. God's a footsteps every day. every day. What do you practice with? The television. Oh, you sing with a musical show? No. What do you mean? I sing with the Western. Western? Why Western? Because I don't want any competition. <laughs> <laughs> well, that don't mean we can't do another duet, right? Or is that kind of like competition? No, no, no. That's not competition. That's called cooperation. Okay, let's cooperate. Mm -hmm. I have a song I would love for us to sing. What's that? Down by the riverside. Okay, I know that. Gonna lay down my sword and shield. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside.
Kroll in Universal's remake, An Imitation of Life. Though Mahalia was no actress, studio executives were prepared to gamble on her ability to bring in big audiences to the box office. Mahalia played herself singing. The movie was about Laura Meredith, a widow and aspiring actress who finds herself six-year-old daughter Susie playing with eight-year-old Sarah Jane. Sarah Jane is the daughter of a black homeless housekeeper, Annie Johnson. The biracial daughter wanted to pass for white. Jackson appeared in this film portraying a choir soloist singing Trouble of the World at Annie's funeral. Troubles of the World was a song usually performed with a faster tempo, and Mahalia's role as a soloist at the funeral in the film when the song was going home to God with true conviction, particularly when she stretches out trouble, making that the focus lyric. Blacks understood the context of Jackson's performance in a white audience. Annie was leaving a world where she could not be treated as an equal, and the lack of equality was one of the greatest troubles of the world. Mahalia's witness did not come from any musical training, but through her singing. Witnessing her world, she felt rather than what she understood intellectually.
Soon after the film's release, she made a guest appearance on TV with Bing Crosby and Dean Martin. Mahalia was now definitely in the big time with the big money. Mahalia was an active supporter of the civil rights movement. Shortly after meeting King at the National Baptist Convention in 1956, Mahalia agreed to sing at a fundraising rally for the Montgomery bus boycott. After that, she frequently accompanied King to perform at rallies and events. Her voice became the soundtrack of the civil rights movement. Mahalia was devoted to Dr. King and accompanied him into some of the most hostile parts of the segregated South for rallies and demonstrations. Even in moments when Dr. King felt discouraged, he would call Mahalia on the phone just to hear her sing. This bond of mutual inspiration and respect between King and Mahalia became, came at a pivotal time during the 1963 March on Washington. Dr. King had struggled with his speech, which was supposed to be kept to five minutes. His advisor argued over which themes he should use King himself was torn between two. Metaphors like he couldn't figure out which one to use or if he would have time for either one. It was when King began to improvise, stating, go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana in the slums of the ghetto of our North cities, knowing that somehow, this situation will and can be changed. It was at that moment that Mahalia Jackson cried out, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. King looked over to Mahalia briefly after she shouted. Then he took the text he had written, the speech he had prepared, and slid it into the left of the podium. He grabbed the podium, looked out onto the 250,000 people attending. It was said that these people were about to go to church and didn't even know it. Then King started speaking completely off the cuff. That ad lib became, I have a dream. Martin Luther King almost never uttered the words during that March on Washington in 1963. History changed forever when gospel singer Mahalia Jackson urged him to share his vision for a peaceful colorblind nation. 48 years ago, the gospel legend Mahalia Jackson died on January 27, 1972. She passed in a Chicago hospital from heart disease. She was 60 years old. The funeral for Jackson was like few New Orleans had ever seen. About 45,000 and 50,000 mourners passed by her open glass and coast mahogany ca casket. Mourners stood in line for hours in the cold winds to pay their respects. President Richard Nixon ride her survivors calling her one of the greatest women of our day. Newspaper reporters from around the country and from Europe covered the funeral. Jackson was clothed in a long blue satin gown with gold and silver sequins. In her hands she held the Bible which she had said contained the only rules worth living by. She was bur buried in Providence Memorial Park in a mausoleum in Montreal. The Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, attended the funeral and sung Precious Lord. Yeah.
lived her life by the gospel and was convinced that everything she said or did rest on the word of God. We've learned how she prevailed through hard times. She was a powerful woman, not a saint, but she recognized she had a message to give through her singing. The world was her audience and she relied on God's message of love. The answer to injustice is, in, is equality. It's embedded within our constitution, a constitution that had at its very core the ideal of equal citizenship under the law, promise of liberty and justice for all. We should never grow weary of trying to do good in what is right. We must continue to forge forward, just like those before us, for a more just, a more equal, a more free and caring, prosperous America. Please give me a hand as we welcome the cast of the 15th annual Walk Through Black History Month back to the stage. <laughs> 